There we go. Okay, welcome everybody and welcome Hampshire Bird Club and um, Hoffman and Allen Bird Clubs. We're just delighted that so many people could come to this. Um, as you know, we're recording it and we will uh, post the recording to the website for people who are uh, unable to come tonight and really wanna see Chris's talk. Um, so I just want you to know that. And if you wanna review it at some point, it'll be on the website to review. Um, so we have tonight uh, Chris Waltz. We're delighted to have him, sometimes known as the beard with binoculars, I understand. And he's been birding for 25 years. And uh, as he said, there's no specific spark bird, but just the realization of all the differences between species was what fascinated him when he took a class in ornithology. He now works at UMass in Barnstable County and has led uh, public Mass program. Audubon. Oh, um, what did I say? Mass UMass? You I'm thinking UMass. Mass Audubon. Thank you for correcting me. Mass Audubon um, in Barnesville County and has led public programs, private groups. He's taught courses in bird identification uh, on the different families of birds. And today we're going to hear about birding Cape Cod and specifically the family of birds known as Caradria formis, mm -hmm. shorebirds, and what we'll be seeing at the Cape. So thank you so much. All right. Um, thank you for having me. Um, yep. So I have designed this slideshow with the beginning birder in mind, as well as some more advanced birding uh, birders. And um, so if there's some new stuff you, you're you going to learn and it's way over your head, that's all right. I put it in there for the random brainiac biologists and other folks that want to hear that kind of stuff. Um, so I'll start now and share my screen. All right. Um, so here we go. So I, I grew up in Western Mass. Uh, I took an ornithology class at Berkshire Community College uh, with Dick Farron. Um, never really got into the whole birding clubs that were in the areas. Uh, and back then there was no eBird yet. Uh, so reporting rarities, uh, my first rarities I remember were uh, two Caspian terns and four Bonaparte's gulls uh, at Anoda Lake in Pittsfield. Uh, and nobody believed me for a while because you know, beginning birder, rare birds like that, uh, not knowing who to tell and get people to go see the birds um, to confirm. Uh, now I'm well known enough that most of the rare birds I find get accepted pretty quickly and word spreads. But I am the property manager at Mass Audubon's Long Pasture Sanctuaries in Barnstable. Uh, so I do all the building and trail maintenance, everything you do for your own homes. Uh, and if you can't, if I can't do it, I, like you, I'd get a contractor. Uh, but I do get to do programs because of my education and special interest in birds. Um, and that's where my experience comes from. And now on this side, I'm also allowed to put up osprey poles. And lately I've been doing window collision treatments uh, and prevention. And, you know, and then of course, bird houses, putting them up for people and in general, just answering bird related questions. So, uh, and teaching birding and beginning birding, just programs and classes uh, most people might remember the specific bird you show them, uh, and then they forget. Sometimes they forget the name, or they forget what it looks like, uh, but by teaching them how to use a field guide and read it from front to back, because that's what it is, is an instruction manual on how to identify birds, uh, and then it shows you all the birds page by page. And one of my things I always do is... Uh, say bring your field guides and have it with you all the time because they are for use in the field. So what we'll try to do here with this uh, slideshow is give you pointers on and a checklist of how to identify shorebirds and related f families, um, uh, family groups. Because uh, typically you would think of shorebirds as peeps or plovers, or sandpipers, 
uh, but it includes gulls and skimmers and some other species uh, that you wouldn't think of as shorebirds. Uh, but they're definitely birds you would find. So uh, checklists for me is, you know, it's things that stand out, beak, feet, and then uh, colors and patterns at the end. Uh, so when telling friends about birds, which you will inevitably do uh, as a birder, as you become more interested in it and learn more, is you will try to tell people, uh, especially ones that you encounter while birding, as they walk by you and say, what are you looking at? Are you looking at the whales? No, I'm looking at birds. What are you looking for? And then they just, you can't tell them specifically what it is because they don't generally know what a shearwater is. Um, so I like to pull out fake bird names like red-breasted whiffle tits or uh, real bird names like fluffy-backed tit babbler. Um, and people don't know whether you're telling them the truth or not. So telling your friends what you saw, they may or may not remember it. But after this, uh, it'll be easier to, for you to describe what they are to these people. So general beginning birding tips is use your field guide, you know, have your binoculars ready to go, whether it's a pair in the car, a pair at the house, one you always carry with you. They don't do any good when they're not around. Uh, but at, with practice, you will learn to bird without optics and use other field marks like flight pattern and behavior. Uh, behaviors like uh, the spotted sandpiper, which bobs its, its tail. Um, or other behaviors that things you can see without binoculars. Uh, notebooks for recording the things that you saw, write it down, draw a sketch uh, so you can check it later. Cameras are incredibly useful, but most people rely on them too heavily. Uh, one of the things that you should aim to do is identify birds in the field before uh, you get the camera up, uh, use the binoculars or, uh, or your uh, general perceptions first. Uh, the internet is a good, useful resource for identifying birds. You got the allaboutbirds.org through Cornell and ebird.org, which you need to have uh, an account with. They now have Birds of the World through Cornell. Uh, it's the same as uh, Merlin or eBird. You can identify but it, uh, all birds uh, across the globe. Uh, and that requires a fee because um, it's relatively new. And then be careful with just Googling uh, black cap chickadee or American robin, because a lot of times if this it text is on a page somewhere, uh, it'll just pop up, but the images won't match. So be careful with searching for images and saying that this is one thing is or another. All right, so I'm gonna go into the anatomy and biology uh, to start uh, so that you know how the family of Cara dryiformes, see nobody says that often enough to really say it well. Um, and uh, how they came to be. So to start, you know, head, shoulders, knees, and toes, and all the parts. Uh, so recognizing from your field guide where they show an image of a bird and all the different parts, uh, the nape, the mantle, the crown, where on the bird you would see certain feathers or certain colors and patterns. Uh, now, obviously, we got a cardinal in the top left there, red bird, black face and bib. Uh, Pretty easy to identify. You can see the feathers all spread out in the primaries, secondaries, tertiaries. And uh, in the bottom left, uh, it's even though it's a bird dog, uh, you can tell pretty easily what species it is based on some cues from the photo. So it's over water, it's actually landing in the water. Um, you got the tail pattern with the black terminal band, white. Um, can't tell scale really, but based on that, you can assume it's a Canada goose. And try as, as mean and terribly invasive as house sparrows and European starlings can get. Try to appreciate them for what they are. Uh, they are birds. They are a species with unique characteristics and patterns. Um, and re disregarding their behaviors and what they can do to some of our native species, they can be quite interesting uh, to watch, especially if you live in an urban area and can't get out birding uh, for unique and rare species that often. Uh, but you notice I showed 
the original, the barn owl with just a black and white image and sketch without any colors and patterns. Cause that's typically one of the, it's can be one of the easiest ways to identify a species, but it can also be one of the most difficult ways to identify a species, especially when it comes to shorebirds. So here are all the different orders of different birds categorized by colors. So you can see common loon, great, the herons, uh, so all these birds fall into different orders. The I-formies uh, is in addition to the root word for the group of birds. So Epodiformes, Carassiformes, Picaformes for woodpeckers. And then Passeriformes includes all the, sh all the swallows and songbirds and crows and blue jays and kinglets and everything else. But our Caradriaformes, uh, the order, uh, you can see the classification here, the, you know, the King Philip came over for good soup. You know, they teach you back in high school and um, it, it's not something you really use unless you go into biology and nomenclature and scientific study and research. General birders don't, it's helpful to know it because then when you try to identify a bird from India and recognizing what order or family it's in, it becomes easier to then narrow down it, narrow it down to species. So you can see that Caradriaformes uh, for the piping plover is also Caradriidae um, for the family. It always ends in I-D-A-E. And then the genus and species Caradrius and then Melodus. Uh, so the, this uh, order also includes all the gulls, terns, oyster catchers, skimmers, woodcocks, killdeers, jaegers, skewers, avocets. And you can see from these silhouettes Part of my initial stages are shape, size, and was with any bird, and then beak. Beak is huge, and then legs. So you can see from these different images, they're long, they're short, they're curved up, they're curved down, they're thick, they're thin. Uh, their legs are long, they're short. Uh, so those are the key identifying features I always mention for people trying to learn their shorebirds. So the evolutionary, how you get all those different beak shapes and leg shapes, uh, leg sizes and lengths uh, was uh, Charles Darwin first thought about it with the Galapagos finches and how these birds, how they are all so different, but managed to get to the same small island. And that's mostly because they changed based on food resources. The pressures were enough that over time they changed. And you can see that bottom left image, the beaks are all different patterns and shapes. Uh, yeah, I throw in these little neat little illustrations and jokes. Uh, yeah, your brother's adapted. So beaks uh, are used for food and building nests. Uh, so when it comes to food, each beak shape is for a specific food. So you can see crackers, chippers, pluckers, and suckers. Um, you got some birds that can use tools. Uh, you got the grubs for picking, uh, the beak for picking grubs out of the wood or out of the ground. Uh, and then the images over the left with the fruit eating toucans and the chisel, the chisel shaped beaks of woodpeckers and filter feeding birds like the flamingos, which I'm still waiting for one to turn up in New England because uh, they seem to be all over the country right now uh, after some of these tropical storms. Uh, but the beak is a tool first and foremost, and the shape of the beak and the size of the beak determines how it's used and what it's used for. Uh, and one way to think of that is with these images here. Uh, could you imagine a, a, a gull with a, a Swiss Army knife type like beak where it can open up a, a shell much easier? So with the shorebirds and gulls, uh, here you can see the top left image, uh, the shapes of a curlew uh, with the down curved bill and the bar-tailed godwit or of any godwits for that matter, and oyster catchers. Uh, it's, does it, their beaks are adapted for grabbing food items deep into the ground. And uh, some of these other shorebirds, the smaller ones are eating things that are not quite so deep or they're chasing the waves like sanderling and getting stuff that's surface that comes up to the surface on the top after the waves rush by. Then you get some species in the top right that are very similar in shape, 
and size, and it's much more difficult to identify them when they're by themselves. Uh, but when they are close and next to each other, it's easier to see the differences. Uh, so some things to think about when you're looking at greater and lesser yellow legs. Uh, the greater yellow legs beak is slightly upturned on the bottoms. So it, it looks like there's a like, little bend in it. Uh, and then the lesser yellow legs, the bill is shorter and thinner. Uh, again, when you can see them together, it's much easier. Um, and then a willet uh, as a, always confuses people as because it's so plain and very little colors or patterns, uh, even in breeding plumage. Uh, but that long, long, heavy, th thick bill is a good identifying feature. And the same with gulls. Uh, you can see general head shape is the same. Some beaks are thicker, have more of a hook at the tip. Some are straighter and thinner. Uh, and then head patterns for gulls. So, uh, and the t most difficult thing about gulls is just that it takes several years, uh, four, up to three or three to five for them to get their adult colors and plumage. Uh, so seeing a, a third year herring gull is much different than a first year herring gull. But recognizing bill shape and and comparative size to other gulls, uh, it becomes easier to pick them out. So with the legs and feet, uh, it's kind of the same process. Uh, how long are the legs? What color are the legs? Are they thick or are they thin? Um, there are birds called a, a, a thick knee uh, in Europe. So uh, it's enough of a di an identifying feature that they are used just like the semi-palmated sandpipers. Though you can't see that in the wild or in the field. So most of the, these birds do have similar shapes and, and sizes. Uh, there's some of their sizes overlap, uh, but there's, their shapes are generally the same as well. Uh, and that's why I don't, uh, there are certain things you can check is, uh, so we've got a couple of birds on the top left. Um, one looks chunkier than the other. You can see it's larger and longer, uh, longer legged. Uh, the one on the left has a longer bill. Uh, so generally if it's, stocky and plump and rounded it's a plover um, if it's long and slender it's generally a sandpiper there are some exceptions like the red knot is a pretty chunky bird uh, but with the bill shape which is long uh, then it's a sandpiper because pipe plovers uh, generally have uh, shorter beaks and then you can see our our gull shapes uh, with the webbed feet uh, and they st tend to stand a little more balanced and, and level than some of these other birds that like stand up more upright like a black-bellied plover. Behaviors can be huge for identifying shorebirds. Uh, Arctic, or I'm, I'm starting to learn that the European names for some of these birds, a, a parasitic Jaeger is referred to as an Arctic uh, Jaeger uh, in Europe. So uh, they call common mergansers here, uh, they call them goosanders in, in Europe. So learning some of the difference in common names uh, can be difficult when you're talking about the same bird, but sounds like it's different. Uh, but a behavior of skuas is to chase smaller birds and steal food from them. Uh, this bird that it's chasing is a black-legged kittiwake. Uh, you could tell by the overall whiteness of the bird uh, throughout the body. The black wingtips don't, the terminals uh, of the primaries don't have any white spots, which most of our gulls do, uh, here on the Cape do. And then uh, the legs are obviously dark in color. Now loons aren't shorebirds, but they, you do see them on the Cape. You see them in the same habitat as some other birds. Uh, I mostly show them here to no, I, uh, highlight the differences in plumages between winter, intermediate and summer. So in the summer, they look drastically different from what they do look like in the winter, as seen by the laughing gull on the bottom there. Uh, they go from having a black head during the summer uh, to a white head with a, some black smudges. Uh, their bill goes from reddish in color to black, and they have their dark legs. So they, they are quite easy to identify when compared up to other gulls uh, with a light, lighter mantle which would be their the word their back and the top side of their wings. Uh, 
they are more of a slate gray color than herring gulls and ring-billed gulls. Now, I always save colors and patterns for last when identifying shorebirds. They all look to blend in with the sand. They're all moving quickly. They all stand together and it becomes very difficult to differentiate one or two birds that might be different. Uh, so it, although it's, it's not a full bird in either image, you can see on the left that the gull has pale or yellowish legs. It has a lighter gray mantle. It has black primaries uh, to the ends with, it looks like some white tips. Uh, and then they are also uh, the wing tips extend beyond the tail. So the only other way to know for sure what species this gull is uh, would be to determine where the photo was taken and what time of year. It looks like it's breeding plumage because of the coloring. It's a full adult, but if it were on the East Coast, I'd say it was a ring-billed gull. And then on the right, we have a long-billed curlew. You can tell from the cinnamon under the wings and the black patch on the, dor on the uh, dorsal side of the wing. That's visible there, plus the long down decurved bill, which you can see clearly in this photo of a long billed curlew. Very similar to wimbrels, but their bills are much shorter compared to the curlew. And we don't get curlews here on the East Coast. It's more of a observational difference thing that I'm trying to show you here. So we're gonna kind of get into our virtual bird trip. Uh, again, general impression, shape and size is something to remember for all bird identification. Uh, and when it comes to our shorebirds, remember, uh, you know, how big was it? How small was it? Was it round and plump versus tall and slender? Um, our, a lot of our larger sandpipers are much more slender and tall compared to our larger uh, plovers. Uh, beak shape, length and colors. Uh, legs uh, with length and color, but always be careful of mud on the legs. So a lot of times they're, when they're foraging for food, they accumulate mud and it dries uh, and it will sometimes make yellow or greenish legs look brown or black. And then uh, our behaviors, you know, how do they fly? Um, what are the pattern of their wings in flight? A lot of the, some of the field guides will show shorebird pa uh, patterns in flight, their wings. And then, they, uh, and then some of them will bob their tails or chase the waves, or um, they will be in the water, uh, depending on whether it's the surf side or the bay side. And then before you get into colors and patterns, you always want to make sure you try for those five first. And then if you get really into it and still don't know, uh, then it comes pr your primary feather projection relative to the tail. So is it, are the feathers longer than the tail or are they shorter than the tail? Uh, and that is a very, very difficult to see even uh, with spotting scopes sometimes. So in this image, we've got two shorebirds, well, two birds that I would consider shorebirds. Uh, and going solely on silhouettes, uh, we've got some ducks in the top right. It looks like a mockingbird or blue jay on the t on the right under them. And then you got sandhill crane or whooping crane. You got a catbird possibly, some kind of bob white. Uh, another catbird or mockingbird, owl, great blue heron, wood stork, swans. Uh, looks like a goose of some kind, some penguins. And then there we get into our uh, gull there in the left above the penguins. That looks like a gull shape. And then morning dove, emu or ostrich, probably emu. Yeah, with those toes, that's an emu. Uh, roosters, and there's our other shorebird, possibly somewhat similar to a phalarope or a killdeer or something. It angles weird on it. And then your woodpecker and rooster and and chickens with the big hawk in the middle with those sharp talons. So that that right there alone, uh, the silhouette uh, was able to tell me enough because you can see beak shape and length and legs like and length. All right. So there's a lot of neat images on 
through and online you can find related to birding. Um, again, most birds were named uh, by holding them in the hand or by uh, features that are prominent and easy to identify. Uh, so some of these illustrations ha play on those terms. Looks uh, like uh, the sandwich turn, yeah, and the parasitic Jaeger, uh, some funny ones. But on the left there, you can see uh, generally uh, when it comes to monitoring shorebirds and piping plovers, we got we know what a piping plover is, and we can see that the next one is too dark because piping plovers blend in with the sand or I'd like to say dry sand, and then the semi-palmated plovers blend in with the mud or wet sand, which is why they are darker. And then you can see the next bird down looks a little thinner or sleek and slender. It has a longer bill, so that right there makes it a sandpiper or a peep. And then for that shape of bill, it could be a, you know, the illustration, dark legs, uh, no wings, dark black wing spot. So that's probably a done one. And then we got uh, a bird you're probably you're familiar with as a shore bird out in Hampshire County, the kill deer, the two neck bands. And our next one down, this is these are one of the so, some of the few exceptions where color is the primary identifying feature you can get right away without regardless of its shape and size or beak and leg length. Uh, the ruddy turnstone, uh, rusty red in color. Uh, the younger ones are more difficult to identify because they don't have that adult plumage. And then we got our least turn, which is uh, much lower to the ground, shorter legs, uh, leans tends to lean forward more uh, when they're perched or standing on the ground. Uh, secondary field marks. So these are the things after beak, lake, uh, beak length and shape, leg length and, and color uh, and behaviors. You get into the, the more detailed stuff, like uh, an American golden plover has a much th a thinner bill than a black-bellied plover. Uh, it also is more a little more heavily patterned in flight. A black-bellied plover shows a white tail, uh, whereas an American golden plover does not have a white tail in flight. Uh, they also have a much more pronounced eyebrow than a, a black-bellied plover. Uh, so it comes down to knowing that those are the field marks to look for when you're looking through a group of 10 plovers that you can't, can't just assume are all black-bellied plovers. Uh, and you can't just willfully force flush them into the air to try to see that, that tail color. Uh, but some other birds will also show some rump patches uh, uh, and different colors and patterns that you'd see in flight, but not when they're just standing and, and resting on the beach. So here we go. We're going to get into some identification here. And you can use the chat to give some answers. Uh, first off, I am going to tell you this photo was taken on the West Coast, but it is a species we get in the East here, especially in the fall through uh, early fall uh, for migration. Uh, and uh, the bird right up front is the key bird that we're going to identify. You can see there are several more behind them. Uh, they're all gen about the same size. Uh, the ones in the back, even though they're farther away, you can see that those birds are all similar in size. And we've got a, a western gull in the background for comparison. So they're a little smaller than a, than a gull. And but that beak shape is our identifying field mark. And you can see it's it's not it kind of droops faster towards the tip than the long billed curlew. And it has a, a rusty crown or cap. And uh, so you can tell that this is a larger bird, it's a shore bird, uh, it's a sandpipe, large sandpiper. This is a wimbrel. Yeah, Chris, we had a couple of answers, Wimbrel and Curlew, but not sure which fla flavor. Oh, yeah. Um, great. There we go. Oops, there we go. Oh, go back. Okay. 
Uh, so you can see these birds here. Okay, the, most of these rest of these pictures should be east coast. Some might be farther south or farther north, but they're all the same species we get here on Cape Cod. So uh, we can see here uh, white belly and breast, and we've got what looks like a black spot at the shoulder, or I'd say the fold in the wing where the shoulder would be, and with black legs. We got a medium length bill. And you see they're right at the surf's edge, uh, and they're probing for items and and uh, insects or arthropods that are very sh shallow in the sand. And so I Chris, can tell you that from behavior that sanderlings. Okay. Yep, they are sanderlings. And if this were a video, you'd see them chasing the waves. They're running away from the wave when it comes in, and running towards the wave when it goes out. And there was a really neat uh, illustrated short on one one of those Disney Pixar movies where they had w tried to pull off a plover as a, a sandpiper. It, the beak shapes were different and critiquing it all the time. They, they did pretty good, though. Otherwise, it was close. So, yes, yeah, sanderlings. All right. So now this is a photo taken in Jan uh, yes, January. So all these birds are in their winter or non-breeding plumage. Uh, some of them have their heads tucked, but you can see all those have uh, the same colors and patterns. They're generally the same size. There's a couple other birds that you can see with that black wing spot that we've already identified as sanderling. So you can see that those other birds, the darker ones, are similar in, in size to the sanderling. Um, but we don't have much to go on for beak shape or length. Uh, they do have dark legs. Um, so it's okay to not know what they are. Um, and it's okay to just take a photo and try to identify it later or find some other birds that are similar that might show those field marks. Um, and then we've got two closer ones uh, on the right that are larger. Um, one, you can see the beak, and uh, the beak's thicker, kind of pointed, though it's not long for its body size. So that, that's a plover. And when we look at the markings, uh, it ends up being a black-bellied plover. Plover, plover. It's like tomato, tomato. I've <laughs> randomly switched, just depending on how tired I get of saying the, a pronunciation one way or the other. Uh, but the next, I think it's the next photo. Should be the next photo. Yeah. So same beach, same same birds, just about. You can see on the left hand side, we've got one of those kind of grayish birds with the black legs and the white bellies with its beak exposed. So you can see it's a a rather medium to long beak for that size bird. It down curves quite a bit. Chris, yes. we have one one answer, Dunlin. Yes, it is Dunlin, and it, it, I, 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 yeah, I've, I popped my chat up a little bit, but I'll wait for you to say that you got some coming in. Yeah, and MJ should know; she's for, she, she she sees enough of them. A couple uh, of answers, Dunlin. Yep. So the majority of those birds are Dunlin, but there's one in the back there on the left. It's very similar. Um, uh, it's darker. So it has it has that dark colored sand mantle and wings to it, uh, but up front you got a, a collar or a bib, a lot like a piping plover. And it it is it, very similar to some of our birds. It does turn or has turned up on Cape Cod uh, unexpectedly. Um, yes, it's very similar to a semi-palmated plover, but that, and it's tough to see in this image because it's not a profile, but that beak is much thicker. Um, it actually is a Wilson's uh, plover. So even though it's not a bird you would generally see on the Cape, uh, it is good to know what one might look like because um, as we've seen earlier this summer, there were a lot of random rare shorebirds that turned up here that uh, you wouldn't be able to identify as a local. 
yeah, there's this little zoomed in photo of the Dunlin and the Wilson's Plover. There we go. Now we get a nice clear image of that Dunlin. And then uh, our black bellied plover in the back. Okay. This is what typically every beach will look like at high tide. Birds are loafing, they're resting. Uh, at mid to lower tides, they're out foraging, especially the, the shorebirds. Uh, gulls can be active depending on uh, time of day or tide. Uh, so you can see here, they're all resting or loafing. They've got their heads tucked into their wings. There are three different species of varying ages uh, in this photo. Um, yeah, so you start to look, how do you, how do you pick out which is which? Well, you start to look at the prominent features. Uh, are there any that are much larger than some of the other ones or smaller? Uh, Wingtips, okay, I'm seeing black primary with white spots and I'm also seeing the one with the head sticking up it's very modeled head patterns uh, not pure white but I could see a, a black tip uh, to their uh, to its bill uh, so that's a, a good identifying field mark for a ring billed gull uh, so that's one there uh, there are a couple of herring gulls mixed in um, Let's see here. I think the herring gulls are in the middle up towards the front. And you see we got in the, right up in the front one that is uh, probably a second year gull, uh, ring-billed gull. Uh, you can see that it's much darker, modeled overall throughout the body, but it's the same size uh, as the other ring-billed gulls. And close with the with the laughing gull there. Look on the left hand side. It's got its head, its bill tucked, but you can see a black smudge or a black spot behind its behind its eye. And I don't know how it looks for you, but for me, I have trouble really seeing the color. Um, it's not quite, it's definitely not pink or yellow. And it's looks quite dark, but it should look red. Uh, so red leg, the black spot, and this photo, let's say, again, I should probably mention, this was a wintertime photo. Uh, so it's a much more rare gull, though we do get them regularly in the winter here. Uh, this is a black-headed gull uh, from Europe. Uh, laughing gulls are quite similar with the black pattern on, the, on their head, uh, but they have a much darker mantle, not a light gray, but a slate gray. And then their leg color uh, is different. And I think the next one should zoom in and focus on, uh, yep, there, oop, there it is. So now we get a little bit closer, though it's not in focus because I cropped the image. Uh, now you can probably see that red, red color um, and the, I'm not quite sure. Oop, go back. Yeah, I think those black wingtips are not from the, they're not from the black-headed gull. They're actually from the gull behind it, which is the, one of the herring gulls. All right, here I have four species of gulls. And this is a photo taken in May, early May. Uh, Race Point Beach. Ah, damn. I got to stop clicking on that. Um, Race Point Beach in early May. We got our very large gull in the back. Uh, you can see the beak shape is different from the other three gulls that we can see. Uh, sticks right out that it's uh, a darker pattern than the white gull. And then from the laughing gull. Uh, up front, we have our black hood. And um, so 
So our our largest gull in North America is And that gull looks to be probably third. It's probably in its third winter or second winter. I'm not sure exactly. It's always difficult. Uh, but you can see that that gull is starting to get a very dark, large back. So we've got our great black-backed gull, uh, a, a younger one. And then that bird immediately in front of it. You can see that the, it's a little bit smaller, even though it's closer to us in the image. And you can see that it's a much more even modeling and color. So it means it's a little bit younger. Uh, and when you go based on size of that bird and the white one next to it with the black back behind it, uh, that is a, a young herring gull. And yes, uh, so we are that large, second bird to the right with all the white. You can see a pink bill with a black tip. It's got a pretty deep hook at the end of it. Yeah, pink legs. And for the size, this is one of our white winged gulls. Uh, when we mention gulls, we say whether it's white bodied or overall white compared to the other ones that have a gray mantle. This is a glaucus gull pretty large and intimidating but it's a little bit bigger or the same size as a herring gull and of course yeah the three laughing gulls the reddish bill the black hood the, the white the white eye uh eye arches slate gray back with mostly black primaries with a couple of little white spots there All right, this one's a little trickier. It's a winter photo. And you can see that it's got a long, somewhat long bill, a crown pattern. Uh, a lot of times I will throw in blurry or, or fuzzy photos for the exact reason of when you get your binoculars up to your face, you don't always have them focus dot that focus dialed right in and it may take a moment and then it flies off or your spotting scope might be a little blurry uh when you, you're looking at them from a far distance but i would say that it's a somewhat chunky bird for its size that long bill it's definitely a sandpiper uh but that key identifying feature is that crown when it's uh, on the ground like this. And in flight, they are very, quite easy to identify because they have uh, a white dorsal stripe down their back. Uh, and a lot of times, uh, if you can identify by, them by sound, they do call quite frequently when they're flying. Yes, this is a short build dowager. Uh, Long billed dowagers rarely turn up on the East Coast. They migrate through the Midwest and Plains and end up down in the Gulf Coast for the winter. If you really want to get into the subspecies of some of these birds, then you can tell whether or not it's a particular subspecies based on some coloring or patterns. Uh, generally, that will require photographs uh, out in the field so that you can closely closely study them and compare them to um, the McLaugh, uh, uh, the library <laughs> um, for eBird and all the photos that Cornell has for different uh, individuals. So don't forget you can do that too. You can go to explore species, type in the species name, and then look at all the photos for that bird that everybody's uh, submitted along with their observations and you can compare uh, your photos to them. All right, so this these two are fairly straightforward. Um, it's a it's beach and Barnstable, end of the summer in August. Uh, we've got a gull and then some other bird with a weird bill. Uh, the top mandible shorter than the bottom, and, and um, you know, bicolored. 
So it's two different colors for the bill, uh, red legs, over all black mantle and wings and primaries, black cap, a white face and breast and belly. And uh, at the beginning of uh, CSI Miami, they always show a group of these birds flying across the screen. Yes, I identify birds even on TV. Um, these are a black skimmer. Uh, and the reason their lower mandible is longer than the top is that as they're flying, they will actually drag that lower mandible through the water. And when they feel or see a fish, they will grab it with their beak as they're flying. Uh, hence why they get the name skimmer. Just like why shearwaters are called shearwaters, it's because they shear just over the surface of the water as they're flying. And they do, I think, think they're they breed out on monomoy uh south of chatham on the cape um and, and we do see them on many random beaches like west dennis beach and uh samson's island katua area uh, they turn up at barnes uh, sandy neck beach occasionally uh especially at, at, into august when the younger birds are f fledging and they're starting their migration and then that gull up front yeah, straightforward ring-billed gull. Yellow eye, black ring around the bill, uh, black primaries, white spots with pale legs. Okay, now we get into some real peep identification here. Um, we got three birds, same size. Uh, their beak is kind of short to medium but still for their body size, it's a long bill. Slight down curve to them, yellow legs. And uh, so these are, these are, they're not wading birds. They're, they can only go in water that's pretty shallow. Uh, you can see that we've got a, um, yep. So uh, it's safe to say that all three of these based on Bill that you can see, the leg colors that you can see of the two, uh, by combining all three, you get least sandpiper out of those. Uh, yellow legs is key. If they were black legs, then they might be something else. Uh, Semi-palmated sandpipers have black legs, but are generally the same size as least sandpipers, and uh, their bill shape is slightly different. Uh, which you can see much more easily when they're together. But when they're separate, you rely on that leg color uh, to help them stand out. All right. So now, oh, uh, stop clicking. All right, so we've got the bird on the left. It looks like wet sand or mud colored, uh, yellow legs, black bill, and the birds on the right, you can see they're sandy colored or dry sand colored, black forehead patch and black collar, the bicolored bill, black tip, orange, orange uh, base, and then black, uh, orange legs. And the collars on these and the forehead patches on these birds can vary. Uh, they can be very thin. They can be very faint. They can be dark and bold. Uh, they can be a complete uh, across the neck, or they could be, there could be a break in between the collar, uh, like the one below on the right. Uh, lots of variation. There's no specific pattern that says it's male or female. You have to go by behavior. So that top right image, it's likely a female to the left, uh, up sitting there in the between the grass on the nest, and the male is nearby. Uh, one of the things we're taught to do as python clover monitors is to sketch the color, the collar and forehead patch of uh, the birds we monitor, so that we can identify them. Because sometimes the beach will only have one pair, and sometimes the beach will have ten pair. Uh, of birds breeding. And then when they all hatch their eggs, then you've got either four chicks or you've got 40 chicks that you need to account for with the pair of birds walking around. 
So yes, we've got piping plover on the right and the mud or sand colored, dark, wet sand colored semi-palmated plover on the left. Okay, now we get into the confusing stuff. These are two, these two birds here. We got similar patterns on their back. Uh, they're both somewhat large sandpipers. You can see they've got longer legs. They're in the water. Um, one's got yellow legs, the other has dark legs. Uh, they've both, you know, can't see how long their bill is, but they're definitely long enough to feed off of an item that's below the below the water surface. Uh, you see one has much more white spots on its on its wings to the left. Uh, it looks like their primary projection, uh, feather projection might be beyond their tail. Uh, the one on the right seems to have a much more specific white spotted pattern to it. And it's got a white eye ring, it looks like. Uh, I'm trying to, I think, yeah, pretty sure this was a late summer photo. Yeah, this was probably September. It was definitely during migration. Uh, you can tell by the vegetation that it's fresh water. Um, and, uh, the yellow legs on the left is probably our most identifying feature and not being able to see the bill or it compared in size to another bird uh, within the same image. Uh, you might only be able to keep narrow it down to yellow legs spa or species. Uh, so it is one of the two yellow leg species we've got here. And on the right, yes, yeah, uh, that white eye ring is key along with the the less patterned appearance uh, for a solitary sandpiper. And the next image should show the yellow leg standing upright with its bill out of the water. There we go. So looking at this image um, upright with its head out of the water, can you identify or differentiate between a lesser yellow legs or greater yellow legs from this photo? You remember that image from the uh, earlier slides? Yeah, yeah, when I showed the comparison between the two. Short, thin, there's no distinctive upturn to the bill uh, or beak. Um, so, yes, this is a lesser yellow legs. And had, had this, remember the solitary uh, sandpiper with the white, it had more of a white eye ring. It had less, less white patterns through the, uh, uh, through the wings. And again, much easier to tell the difference when they're all together. All right, this one's pretty diagnostic, but these birds seem to turn up on the Cape every year or every other year, a couple of reliable spots. Um, this one turned out to be a June sighting on the Cape, which is extremely rare. Uh, most of our sightings end up being in the fall uh, so they're, they're not in breeding plumage like this one is, but diagnostic field marks for this bird, especially in breeding plumage, you get the color patterns, black and white wings and back, uh, reddish neck and head, uh, white, fa white face, and, and uh, that weird upturned bill at the tip, uh, long legged so walking through the marsh. Yes, this is the American avocet. Uh, generally, when we get them in the in the fall, they're good. they're not as brightly colored, and they they're younger. Uh, always a treat to see. Uh, but recognizing that it's a large sandpiper type bird with a, that slender, tall body and that long bill for its shape and size. All right. 
You got a couple here now. Now this is zoomed in and really close. They certainly aren't actually this big. Um, but our field marks, we got one with yellow legs, some streaking and spots up in the breast and flanks area. Uh, it looks like that bird closest to us has a slightly down curved bill and uh, it's walking toward us so we can't really see the profile and then the bird behind it has black legs a thicker bill but still short for its size so that's another sandpiper and It's got a this weird red wash to its face uh, and a little bit of red up into its back. And it's more heavily patterned on its back compared to a lot of our other shorebirds. So we can probably identify the closer bird to us and then use that to compare size and patterns for the bird behind it. Yeah, I'm, I know if I tell you where this photo was taken, you're probably going to figure it out because some of you probably chased after it. Um, this photo was a fall migration. I think it was late, late July, a few years ago, and it was close to the Cape. And they have had them on the Cape, but this sighting was in Rhode Island. And that might help trigger your map, some of your memories if you went for it. So the bird up close for us is a least sandpiper. Yeah, you might think that would uh, it would be a red knot with the color in its face like that. But a red knot has a much longer bill or beak for its size and thicker. This bill looks more like the shape of, of a semi-palmated sandpiper's bill. Uh, but being larger than the least sandpiper because that is still like a, a foot behind the least. Yeah. Kyron, yeah. That's a, that's the redneck stint and it is a European bird and it has turned up on Cape Cod beaches in the past. Uh, it just, this photo was not from that one. Uh, so narrowing down a, your, selection based on beak length and shape and size and leg length and size and then size compared to other birds that uh, that you know the identification of can help you narrow it down and say well geez this is not in my eastern field guide and then you get your north america full north american guide and then you look into your vagrant species or any other resources you take a photograph you post it notorious what's this bird on facebook People just post it. Well, I don't know what this is. I'm not into birding. What is it? And then they find some stupid rare hummingbird that that nobody's seen for at, at all ever in Mississippi. And then they they're the ones to find it. Um, so Facebook can sometimes be a good resource uh, for finding rare birds. Okay, this one's definitely Cape Cod. This one is July. This one is uh, let's see close to. Monomoy and Chatham in the outer cape. Uh, the bird on the on the right image that's nice and clear and up close is the same bird in, on the right side in the left hand image. Um, the bird on the far left we can see it appears white. Uh, the sun is shining, but you can see that black belly. It has a longer some bill of some shape. Um, looks pretty long for its size. Yeah, you're right. Yep. So we got a Dunlin there on the left. Uh, it's still showing a little bit of breeding plumage. So this is a, a mid July or late July photo. And then that bird to its right is larger, even though it's behind it in a way. Uh, so now if we move to the right hand side, we're looking at it, we can see um, uh, black legs, a very, very long thin decurved bill uh no red knot has a, a some a really straight bill and thicker uh though it is showing some color I don't know, like yeah it is showing some red if i change my angle of the screen here it is showing some red in the breast there uh not a lot of white the primaries you can see they looks like they they're shorter than the tail or just i can't quite tell from that image 
Um, so even photos don't always help. Yeah, MJ. Yeah. That's the curlew sandpiper that turned up. That's another e European bird uh, that turns up. Always check all your shorebirds in, during fall migration here on Cape Cod, especially uh, anywhere that has a lot of flats and tidal pools where these birds will feed and forage for food during migration. Um, pay attention to the winds. You get some tropical storms that are pushing north or you get some winds out of the east. And uh, don't forget a lot of these birds that breed up in the Arctic Circle, uh, every direction is south. Uh, whether they uh, go south into Russia or south into Canada, it's all south and they turn up on the east coast occasionally. So yeah, Curdaloo Sandpiper, a very chunky sandpiper for uh, what we're used to. But that long, thin bill, which or beak, which is longer than a Dunlin's, uh, is diagnostic and quite easy to pick out as a different bird. Okay, I know MJ saw this one. I actually think I took this photo through her scope, so <laughs> she knows what it is. Uh, this is not a bird you would expect to ever get on Cape Cod. It's supposed to be in the Colorado Rockies. It's supposed to be uh, in the plains. Uh, most people, when they see them, it's like a kill deer way in the distance in some field, not clear. Um, the first recorded sighting of one of these birds on Cape Cod was in early 1900s. It was over 100 years ago. I can tell you that. That bird that was seen 100 years ago was shot, killed, stuffed, and it's in a museum. Um, Yes, I will do that. Uh, in a museum in Boston. This is a mountain plover. You can see for that shape and size, the short bill, definitely a plover, not a sandpiper. And then the color patterns. And then this is bigger than a killdeer. This is a big bird um, for a plover. Yes, they, yeah, they they should be in agricultural fields and uh, definitely not on a beach 3,000 miles away. Uh, so this was uh, a rare, just one of the rarities uh, of this summer, um, whether it was weather patterns that forced them to move around, but uh, you never know. This was identified by a piping plover monitor. Remember that image where this is a piping plover. That's too dark to be a piping plover. That's, you know, and then so on, going through that checklist of, uh, I know it's something different, but I don't know what it is. So um, again, taking a photo, sharing it, spreading the word, uh, and then you get a bunch of people uh, c gathering uh, to go see it. So a mountain plover on a Cape Cod beach in July, never. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, it, it could have, uh, but it's most likely w uh, weather patterns and winds. Or just maybe their, maybe their compass is off because uh, some birds can navigate really well and some struggle. Okay, let's start with the one way in the back. We know it's a gull. It's got a light gray mantle, black primaries. Uh, might be some white spots, but it, it could also be some sun glare from uh, the image. Um, it's got somewhat of a hefty beak with a red spot on the lower mandible. And, uh, yes, yep. So we got our, our herring gull, an adult adult plumage, so pink legs, light gray mantle. Uh, some other species to look out for for gulls um, is lesser black-backed gull. It's the size of a herring gull, but its back or mantle is more slate gray like a laughing gull. And, and their legs are yellow instead of pink. So in between the size of a great black back gull and a herring gull, um, kind of like if you were to mesh the two together and you get, were get to get an immediate intermediate uh, plumage, that would be it. All right. And yes, yeah, you got our semi-palmated plover. You get the dark, wet, sand-colored back and mantle and cap with a one co black collar. Um, 
I can tell you this was South Cape Beach. And I know that MJ went to see it and some others of you that were from Central Mass that made the drive down uh, mid-August. That bird on the right, uh, you can see it. It does have a faint collar. It's got that eye, uh, that band across the face and the cap. Um, and it's a little bit reddish. This is that one of that, those rare birds that turned up this summer. Uh, the lesser sand plover. Uh, one of the sudden, of course, there's a subspecies, a Siberian, or I don't even know what the other one is because that's for the pro, the pros at Cornell to figure out. Uh, I'm just happy at this point to get another lifer. Um, so, again, check every bird. Uh, yeah, when you got like 30 of them and they all look like semi palmated plovers, it's easy to pick out the one that's a little bit different if you take your time. Uh, don't don't uh, brush any aside as you're walking down the beach and just assume, oh, that's a standerling or, oh, that's that. Uh, always take a closer look. Okay, so now that we've gone through that, that handles most of the, the common shorebirds yet you would see, this, the peeps and the sandpipers and the common plovers with a few rarities mixed in that would you make you say, hey, why does this one look so different? Why can't I find it in my guide? Snap that photo. Even if it's a phone photo through a spotting scope or through your binoculars, that'll be quite easy uh, to do with a little bit of practice. They even sell attachments you can put on your scope so the phone sits right where it's supposed to. Um, and, but it, yeah, with a little bit of practice, you'll get it. And yeah, there, there are lots of these nice little bird comics. Uh, always have your binoculars, always have your field guides. Um, and one, one field guide that you use to in the field. And then you've get like me, I've got my four shelves of, uh, of library that are all different bird guides for reference, specifically for gulls, specifically for, um, sandpipers and shorebirds and hawks and seabirds and, Australian birds and Costa Rican birds. And um, now you can put the apps on your phone and you can use the Merlin app and uh, be careful with that. And all about and North American birds and, and Sibley guide. And uh, there's a lot of references uh, and lots of good illustrators and good birders creating new field guides all the time. So with some things to consider when going burden on the Cape tide charts uh, and knowing the, the, the depth of those tides. You don't want to drive out to an area um, uh, like in Wellfleet and drive over to this island and do some birding and go to drive back and the road is covered in water. Um, <clears throat> that definitely happens. Or you don't want to go walking out into an area and, and be stuck for eight hours until the tide come, changes enough that you can walk back. Um, so most of our shorebirds uh, are active depending on the tide. They'll feed at night when the tide is right. They'll they'll feed um, during the any time of the day when the tide is high. They will just be resting because um, you gotta go you gotta go eat when the when the shop is open. Uh, be aware of parking on these beaches. They charge everywhere for parking. Very tough to find free parking anywhere, um, especially if it's a beach. Um, Sometimes it's worth it paying the $20, $25 or whatever they charge for a week pass if you're here for the week, um, for the day. Uh, but generally after uh, Labor Day, right, they all stop charging. Uh, weather patterns. Any of those winds that blow out of the west, uh, first encounter beach is great for seabirds that get blown into the bay, uh, Cape Cod Bay, and then they circle around uh, to uh, – trying to get out and into the open ocean and then use your eBird reports and hotspots. And then how long it takes to get to one area to another. Uh, you know, you might want to bird the canal in Falmouth, but also want to go to race point. Well, that's a good two hours, uh, two hour drive, especially the right time of year with traffic. So I always keep that in mind. Um, You'll be able to look through a lot of this 
uh, later when it turns up on YouTube, then you can pause it uh, and get some of these. But if you were to pull up a list of hotspots, uh, when you go to eBird, explore, explore hotspots, and you don't forget to change the time of year. So if you're coming here for early August, then set your, set the time of year for August, and it'll show you the reports just for that month for current year, last 10 years, all years. It'll show you what birds you can see um, on these at these hotspots at these locations for that time of year. But they're all great spots. Um, just be mindful of the tide. The tide on the north side is it can change from zero feet to 12 feet, depending on the time of the month. Uh, and the south side, the tide only changes a few feet. Uh, but it's still enough of a drastic difference that uh, the birds will gather in an area and get pushed right up to you. So best time would be to show up mid-tide flooding so that when the tide floods to closer to high tide, it pushes all the birds right up to you. All right, um, we'll get into some questions if you have any. Uh, this one's always fun. Somebody, uh, some non-birder will, and non-biologist, scientific, scientific person will ask me something like this or it'll come up and I'll say, what do you think came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, based on what we know from Darwin, uh, a bird with a different beak slightly different from its parents can hatch from an egg so the egg always came first regardless you know you didn't you don't need a chicken to get a chicken to come out of an egg you need some some relative that's somewhat closely related for that chicken to come out of that egg so now uh, any chicken and egg you get from the grocery store it, it's not going to be anything other than a chicken coming from the, those eggs all right so feel free to email me and, you know, if you got photographs of a bird you want to identify or can't figure out, I mean, I'm sure you've got contacts through your bird clubs out there that you can uh, see your birding friends and send them photos or uh, your local eBird reviewer, just put it in there and say it's something super rare and then they'll immediately jump on it and be like, well, it's not that. Um, but they can definitely help you. Uh, identify those and if you want any tips on how to prevent birds from hitting windows or s make the chances a lot smaller um, there are some products out there that do a good job um, and um, not everybody can have an osprey pole I can just say that right there you can't put it in your backyard just because you want to have one in your backyard uh, unless your backyard is marsh all right, so if anybody has any questions, we'll leave several minutes for that. Um, all right. Uh, let's see here. I'm not qu quite sure. I don't think there's a difference between the sexes and avocets. I think males and females look similar. All right. You're welcome. Yeah, if you couldn't tell, I'll 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 talk for like three or four hours about birds. <laughs> it, it, really, what stops me is somebody else's schedule. Yeah, you, know, you got anywhere to be? Don't ask me any questions about birds. Thank you. Yes, I think the Eskimo curlew is extinct. Um, there. Of course, there's a a picture or a print in one of my doctor's offices. They had it says something about said it was a curlew of some kind. I can't quite remember, but I think when I looked it up, it was it was extinct. Hey, hey, Hobie, get a little closer to the camera, why don't you? <laughs> Do we have any more questions? Any questions? Eh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Um, I would say this though, if you do have the Merlin app, it does great at identifying photos that you submit to it. Uh, if you're using it to record sounds, um, 
if it's something rare, if you're looking at it and it pops up and it's like unreported, that's fine. Unreported in an area is normal. But when it says rare, like black-throated gray warbler or something else, stop, see if it does it again, see if you can pinpoint what's making the sound and then get your eyes on it. And at least then if you could confirm the sound and this visually what you saw, then it's a little more believable when it comes to certain species. But it's a great tool. It's just beginning birders kind of rely on it or beginning, I want to say beginning, I mean like non-birders. They're like, oh, have you heard about this app? And it can do this. Um, just be careful with that. Okay, I think we've got all our questions. Okay. I just Great. want to thank you so much, Chris. This was fascinating. We're all going to rush down to the Cape right now. <laughs> yeah, well, but right now know. it's all uh, sparrows and, and, and warblers. Yeah. Most of our shorebirds have left, but there are still some red knots around uh, and some uh, American golden plovers and dunlins will be around. So well, they'd be worth the trip. Yes. Yep. Thank you so much. Thanks, Linda. Yeah, thanks, MJ. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate it. Thank you. So I'm going to stop the recording now. Okay.